Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for the first of this year's IFTA screen discussions. Uh, each year, we take time out to talk to the people behind all of the submitted titles for the IFTA Film and Drama Awards. And we're delighted this year to begin the series with Joyride. Uh, we're joined today by Ema Reynolds, who's the director, Alva Kilgan, the writer, Aoife Sullivan, who produced for Subotica, and wonderful actors, Charlie Reed and Lachlan Omweron. You're all very welcome, guys. Thanks, Thank you. Maker. Lovely to be here. Uh, Thank you for taking the time to uh, come and join us. Um, so we're going to talk about Joyride. Um, it's um, it's an absolutely lovely film, and rewatching it again, it's it, something that really struck me about is it's a great story that we've seen a bit more of lately, but not a lot of previous that where you get these kind of wonderful messy, uh, I suppose, mother characters and these messy real kind of teenagers, which I think is one of my favourite things about it. Um, and if I can start with you, Alva, I just wonder like where the story came from. I've heard that it was something you were inspired by when you're walking around the wilds of Kerry just after having your your own child and I'm, I'm just wondering yes. if you tell me a little bit about <laughs> yeah I had terrible trouble breastfeeding my god and everything about it the physicality of it everything the hold the baby had on me everything um and I was walking the baby around exactly like that listening to the radio on my headset and it was a story on RT1 about a, a fella, I think in Tipperary, he'd stolen a car and there was a baby in the back of it. And I was so desperate for an insight into how to latch a child on. I was thinking, imagine if that fella, imagine if, imagine if he took me away. And uh, so, so that was the core, there's a scene in the film and that was the core scene. It's effectively a midpoint moment. And the film grew out either side of that moment. But I did imagine what if a 14 year old fella could help this messy woman who was questioning everything in terms of how suited she was to motherhood, if she was suited at all. And if she wasn't suited, what would the answer? How could she solve this messy conundrum? That's yeah. that's wonderful. Um, and like, as I suppose, is that something you do as a writer is kind of look at these kind of things you're considering and struggling with and like almost try and kind of write in like a, the problem and see what kind of comes out of it or issues you're having? Yeah. Truby has this thing about when you're writing the premise of the film. So you're not even at script level and he's got these mm. 10 steps to premise. And the first one is the film should change your life, like in actually going through the process of writing it. Like you should have some way formulated an opinion that's different to the one you may have started with. Otherwise, you're writing a propagandist piece and you're just preaching at everyone. So like I, I often write a film where I'm not sure what the answer is. You know, I mm. suspect this is where I lie morally, but I'm not entirely sure. And so that's nice, you know. Um, just to dig deep on something with the hope that over the course, because it takes it takes me anyway, I take a long time to write, like over the course of the writing years that you will have effectively grown to a new understanding of the central crisis at the heart of the film. That's that, what I that's hope what, That's um, kind of, I think what John Teed said was like the best, all the best writers have the ability to kind of work with that uncertainty, not know what the answer is yet. And you kind of write much better work as a result of that. Uh, you've also reminded me of something, um, Will Collins, who wrote uh, some of the sea said once, oh, yeah. with him, where he was just like, you, you need to have an uncomfortable, tr un uncomfortable truth at the heart of your story, and that means you're going to have to face one yourself as a writer, which yeah. I thought was fascinating. Um, so, yeah. uh, Eva, just to you, um, when the story did come your way, once Alva had kind of got it, I suppose maybe down to a draft or two stage, or had the premise and some characters in there, what, what, how did it come your way, and what was it made? you want to make this your first narrative feature? Because obviously you've been doing amazing work on editing and documentaries for years and between Heroes Cuba and The Fardest and Song Swallow and Away, they're all something you clearly have a keen interest in yourself as well as a topic. But I'm just wondering how that translates from documentary into feature. What was it about this that kind of really sparked that interest you have? No, well, I was, I was even though I was making feature documentaries as a director, um, mm. My background had been in drama, mostly as an editor. And I was, uh, when Aoife sent me the script in 2018, I was actively looking for drama scripts to, oh. to get involved with and, and to make as my first film. Um, loved the film, loved, it. at that point, they, Aoife and Alva had developed it for a couple of years and hadn't found the right voice for it. And um, I was delighted to read it, loved it on first <laughs> sight, love, love it first reading. The size of the heart in the film, the the characters, uh, you know, in particular, obviously, the, the this messy, snarky, not people pleaser character of joy at the center of it. 
But, you know, if you're talking about what's the personal connection or what's the, you know, I was just saying there that film should change you in the journey or, or be tapping into questions you're asking yourself. And, and it, you know, if it's not getting too tragic, my, my, my own mother died when I was very young, age four. And I think I have spent my life asking questions around what is a mother? What makes a mother? What's the value of a mother? You know, what what is the difference between having one and not having one? Charlie's character loses his mother. Joy has had a, a perhaps a malign influence from her own mother as a mother herself doesn't feel worthy, you know, and, and it goes so far as to want to give up this baby as a response to that all those traumas, you know, so it very much fed in, even though it's, you know, it's exuberant and it's funny and it's emotional and it's warm hearted feel good journey. At, at its core, these ideas of family and found family and mother. And I kept saying to myself all the time, the thing that was ticking on me was it's never too late to have a happy childhood, you know, like that, those ideas that the joy is transformed and motherhood is the, the lens through which this film is seen, you know, the value of motherhood. So that was really the the deep connection I had with it. And, and I think I did learn and change over the course, of it, which is wonderful. That's a beautiful way of putting it. Um, Aoife, that for you, uh, as uh, Eimear mentioned there yourself and Alva had developed this for quite a while, um, obviously you saw the potential in it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about like the development process on it? Like, did it change much from when Alva came to you or you found Alva's uh, story first? And how was the process in getting it to the point where it came to Eimear? <clears throat> Absolutely. So, yeah, funnily enough, it, it did change a huge amount during the process, but we actually came back to the original premise towards the end. Um, it's a funny one. It was a script that I, an idea and a script that I really loved from the get go. And I think Alva's writing is full of heart and full of humour. And that was there from the beginning. And, and Joy and Molly were just these amazing characters that jumped off the page. Um, and as Emer said, we had we couldn't find our voice for a while. We had a couple of directors who really loved it as well, but they wanted to change it quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so we went through that little adventure with them and we changed it and we did what they wanted. And Alva, I think by the end of it, was pulling her hair out going, what is it about anymore? I'm not, I forget what it's all about, you know, and we both felt like that. And actually, Dervla Regan was with Screen Ireland at the time, and she was a huge champion uh, of the script. And all three of us thought, we have to get back to basics. And then as soon as we showed it to Emer, she was like, I like this original premise. You know, the original script is the best. You know, you don't need all of those different changes that you've done. So we were absolutely, it was like a huge relief, you know, it was a huge sigh of relief. We had faith in the original idea and the original script. And obviously there was tweaks and changes and revisions and, and bits and pieces, but we didn't have to do any massive changes to make it work because it already worked the way it was. Um, and so we went back to our original beautiful story and I'm really glad we did. And that's what we made. I, th I think most people who've seen it will probably be glad you went back to it as well because it, it works yeah. terrifically. And it does have, I think what all of you are saying, there are real heart to it like I mean films meant to make you feel something and you have to feel it coming from the people behind it I think and that's certainly yeah. the case with yeah. yeah one of one of the favorite things I read about it and there was lots of things that were like a punch to the gut that made me nearly cry they were so I thought they were so tough but one of the favorite things I read was once you get out of your own way you'll really enjoy <laughs> this film and I love the notion of if you're going yeah. in cynical there's a certain degree of heart about this that'll be kind of a bumpy ride for you but if you can get out of your own way and just enjoy it you'll have a lovely journey with it like a, a real like we, we've had such positive audience feedback about like people just on the ground not film critics just regular old cinema goers and just and so I think that's a nice phrase to, to remember on starting it just yeah park the yeah, cynicism your own way. I like that we it's gave it a huge heart yeah. You know, it had a heart to start with, but then Emer, I think you said, well, let's, let's, you know, we don't have to make it dark and cynical on, uh, you know, like, let's, let's lean into the heart of it. Let's, yeah, yeah I wanted, we all part. wanted the film to wear its heart on its sleeve, you know, like it not hiding it, like Joy, you know, she's not, she's not coy and demure, you know, she's loud, she's exuberant, she's defiant, you know, we wanted the film to just, you know, Turn up that, you know, that that yeah. that joy and defiance. It's really nicely, like in, in that sense, in that it's 
it's like, I wouldn't say quite earnest. It does wear its heart on its sleeve, but it's not cynical, but it is real, if that makes yeah. sense. So that's I think, a nice fine line. I think people do think in absolutes that it has to be, or that something is could either be very saccharine or very cynical and dark. And there's real life is in the middle as well. I think, and Absolutely. it kind of, I think hits that wonderfully. If you can get out of your way, or you always say to people, mm. stop trying to be cool and just like things. You know, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> things that are likable, you know, and feel. Um, on that, if I can turn to our two uh, wonderful actors here, Charlie and Lachlan. Um, Lachlan, I might start with you. Um, when the script came your way, what was it about it? And I suppose the character of, of James, who is, for all intents and purposes, I was going to say like the villain or the baddie, but he's not. He's the antagonist, but like there is definitely a lot of nuance to him as well. I mean, the poor man's been through a lot, but it's still very much the the antagonist. How, how did you react to the script first and the character of James then? I, you're you're still muted. Sorry. To take, good question. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, <laughs> Take you back to the process, I suppose, as uh, an actor, uh, sometimes we just get a, a scene or two to, to record. And so we have to make assumptions as to what the story is even about. But in this case, there was a real generosity from the production team, I suppose, and the directors, but especially uh, the, the writing. Alva had not only given us the script, but she'd written these prose pieces for each character. And I took it as almost like monologues for characters. And as much as he was the villain, I could really empathize with a man who had lost his wife that he dearly loved. And you could that was evident in the monologue of, of, of Rita, how he adored her and how she was the glue in the whole system of their family. Now, he'd lost her and he was unable to really um, to hold things together. So he had to borrow money, for example. He, he maybe uh, drank his loneliness away. So he'd ended up with what I would just call general addictions, I suppose, in mm. gambling and the trouble with those, which are serious issues. And he was probably struggling with alcoholism because he's always drinking the whole time and his family was falling apart around him. So I saw a very real person there um, in that. And that was the generosity of the writing that showed that. Mm. So I, 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 not that I really empathized with him, but I, because I don't know a situation, but I could tell that somebody who's struggling for dear life and putting on a brave face and trying to deal with everything and hold it together. And he, in that story, he would, you might say, hits his rock bottom. He's lost mm. everything. He's lost his money. He's losing his, he's lost his job. He's in danger. And at the very last straw is he loses his child. Mm. away. And I, th I think for me, that story with James was, this is, is Nadir, this is his last point, this is his rock bottom, and you'd hope, you'd imagine if there was a sequel for him that he would turn his life around and make things good again. Um, I think you've hit the nail on the head there because he's not a boo hiss kind of antagonist in this. It, it does seem like someone who has tried to fill, I suppose, the infinite hole where love was and it's just impossible and it's just like getting deeper and deeper into the wrong side of things. Um, Charlie, if I can turn to you, um, you, this was your first uh, ever role, if I'm not mistaken. I believe you were 14 at the time of, of shooting. Am I right in that? Yeah, I, w I was 14, and it was my it was my first film. Well, well, firstly, congratulations! It's a terrific performance. Um, how? Firstly, I suppose, how did you get involved? How did it come your, your way? And what well, was I the mean, we I was looking to get into film at the start, and. Um, there was a casting call. I, my dad had seen a casting call and he said, is this something you'd be interested in? It was an, an immediate yes. And I I went through the pieces that they'd given us and there was just, there's an automatic connection that I saw between myself and Molly. Like I was able to channel my inner Irish teenager and bring him out of it inside of Molly. And I think that, I think as much as he tries to put on a, uh, a big man look I mean there is a, there is a lot of heart there and mm. I saw that and I used it and I think I think there's as you go on later in the film you see more and more of the softer person that Molly is and I'm really happy with the way that I sort of tried and showed that. Uh, I think you should be very proud of that there's uh, I think a tendency to depict teens in some way that they're you have to get through to their you know soft drinks here and they're all kind of like that but I think there was always that sense with Molly from moment one that there was like a really caring loving person there yeah no there there really is and I think it took Joy a bit of time to 
get through, but she eventually saw who he really is. Uh, absolutely. And I suppose if we could talk a little bit about, we'll go back to um, Imar Alba and Aoife for a second, but about Joy herself, you got um, the wonderful Olivia Coleman in. And it's just in thinking about this for a while, I, I think I'd seen her in The Lost Daughter just before I saw this. And it was almost like she was the daughter of her character in that or a mother like that. And it was I found a really interesting kind of like double bill of portrayals of motherhood almost in it. Um, I'm just wondering how you got her involved in the first place, what her response was. Um, maybe if, if, if you can, or I'll, um, whoever. Oh yeah, no, she was our top choice. Uh, we sat, I remember we sat in a cafe in Dublin and went through our casting list with Elaine Granger, our casting director. And we were sort of laughing, you know, putting Olivia on the top going, oh yeah, you know, fat chance, but sure, we may as well try, why not? You know, we almost didn't because we're an indie, you know, lowish budget in comparison to the type of films that Olivia does um, film. And sure, we sent it off anyway, just kind of on the off chance. We said, we may as well, she would be absolutely amazing. Um, and we, she, it took her a while to get around to it, obviously mad busy all the time. Um, but then the word came back that she, that she loved it and we were just blown away. She really wanted to do it. Um, and then there was the, the joy of trying to, uh, fit around the schedule because, you know, there was all kinds of films coming up, huge ones and Marvel and Willy Wonka and all the rest of it. And, uh, so she finally then found a window. There was a, a point in the process where Olivia felt so bad in keeping us waiting that she said to her agent, I don't, you know, should I let it go? What will I do? And apparently we heard this through the agent. She read the script again that night and she said, there's no way I can let this go. This, this is my baby. I'm, I'm doing this. And so she was fully in and uh, we found a window in 2021 uh, in the summer and it was perfect. It was Kerry, um, you know, we didn't have the usual overrun of tourists because of COVID, mm. um, although there was plenty of Irish people staycationing. Um, but it was brilliant. And it was a really lovely five weeks uh, that we spent in the wilds of Kerry. And Emer picked amazing locations. Olivia really enjoyed herself. We found out that she has a, a court granny. So um, she felt at home. Oh, that's wonderful. And, and yeah. how, how did you feel like once like let's say the top choice was there like was that someone you like would have had in mind for joy I don't know if you write with anyone particular in mind or did you feel like you had to change anything about joy or was that like perfect no it was beyond my expectations because I do remember ringing I think it was you Aoife from the car park at Little just about to do the big shop when I was gen <laughs> obviously hangry because I was like, what drugs are we on here, lad? Can we just get real? Um, because I think there was some other big names on it. And then there was other names, big names that probably would have drawn um, lots of attention, but were just not right, I felt. So I was I was just, just delighted and relieved and, yeah, grateful that she wanted to do it. Like, you know, because it was beyond my expectations, for sure, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. And, and Emer, for you, then, I'd like, as your first narrative feature, I suppose, directing actors like the two wonderful ones we have here and like Olivia, what was that process like for you coming from, I suppose, I know you've edited an awful lot of um, narrative features, but coming from documentary, was there much rehearsal uh, like in this with Olivia and Charlie and Lockton, or was it something you kind of tried to keep raw like a documentary kind of stuff? Yeah, um, we had... Uh... We had rehearsal time screened off in that final week, you know, indie or, or modest budget films. I find it hard often to hold on to the, the rehearsal time coming up to the shoot, you know, um, but we were managing to hold on to three or four days. It kind of didn't need them because it turns out that Olivia doesn't really like to rehearse. So, <laughs> so we kind of we found ourselves, um, Lachlan, myself, Charlie and Olivia in a room really spending the time getting to know each other um, and playing. And, you know, I wanted at the very minimum that we would get Charlie and Olivia doing a couple of the scenes together, just because it was Charlie's first film. And, you know, I didn't want we're out on the shoot on the first day with all the crew and all the business, you know, and he's having to act up opposite, in, you know, an Oscar winner, you know. So we did, we did a small bit in the garden of the hotel we were in. We did some of the walking scenes, but she, she brought this energy and it's amazing that the guys are up for it and I was up for it because as you say coming from documentary I you know you, you you want the honesty you want the realness and you know you're you're able to perceive it you know once you see it and 
it involves a huge amount of bravery and and courage and you know allowing yourself to be instinctive but everybody was on board with it and um I think you see that in the film we didn't do an awful lot of takes you know for for many mm. of the scenes you know it was there was just real authenticity to it and she's an incredibly generous actor as are Charlie and Lachlan so uh it was it was it all worked out without rehearsals <laughs> Um, that's fascinating. Like I know I've spoken with some actors who don't like the rehearsal thing. Um, and I'm like, oh, so you prefer going like that? They're like, oh God, no, I hate going in on rehearsal. It's just the only way it works for me. It's bloody terrifying, but it's mm -hmm. it's what works. Um, but I always found that really fascinating just to go like this works, but it, it's terrifying. Um, Char Charlie, like for you, how how was it? Like, I mean, uh, you mentioned like a lot of generosity from Olivia, and I'm sure Lockton as well, and a lot of energy into that as well. How was that for you? Because your performance is so so naturalistic it's 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 very hard to believe like there's a performance there almost like it's so like you're not molly obviously in real life but molly just seems so real in that and it seems like that energy was a big part of that would that be fair yeah i mean when we arrived in kerry on i think it was about four or five days before the shoot and we actually we didn't plan on this so we were going out for we were going down uh, to go on a walk to the ground to the hotel and mm. we just see just see Olivia sitting on a chair um, at a random table outside and I just looked at her and I was like that's, that's not her is it that's that's not her she wouldn't she wouldn't just be sitting there and then my dad goes yeah that's her and I was like okay okay I have to go over I have to say something and then so I went over and I I said I, I'm Charlie who's playing Molly she was like oh my god and she just she literally blew up immediately and then we just and then Lachlan came down after about 20 minutes as well. So that was the first time I had met Olivia and Lachlan. It was a bit of an unexpected surprise. And then I got to know them like really well throughout those days before we went into the shoot, which I think was a big part to play with everything. And the reason why I was actually quite comfortable with everyone before I had went on. And Olivia and Lachlan and Emer and everybody just made it so easy to work alongside because they were so, they were there to answer any questions. They were so nice. And it was just everything, all the nerves just slowly melted away and turned into excitement when I was on set. You know, it was like any time I was with everyone on set, even when we were filming the ADs, I got on with a lot of the ADs and I made a lot of friends and a lot of memories. And I'm really happy that I, I, that I got that opportunity to be so happy on set because everyone was so nice and so welcoming to me. That's a wonderful thing to hear, like from, especially I suppose the stereotypical idea we have of film sets and, you know, you need to be a complete tyrant, which I know Emer isn't, uh, <laughs> to get to look really great work, but it's lovely to hear something so lovely. Lachlan, how, well, how I, was it I wasn't on, I, I was just going to say, I wasn't on set, but I kept on hearing stories. Around. That's why it was so nice, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> yes, it <laughs> but it was like they were trying to out-nice each other, because one day I think an ice cream van appeared out of nowhere. Then yeah. another day, a hot chocolate. I don't know. There was coffee vans. There was vans appearing with goodies from all corners. It just seemed like it was a re. I was on set for one day, and it did seem like a really nice, yeah, really nice chillaxed kind of. I'd, look, I'd the film them. is about the, the film is about family and friendship and hope and healing and all these lovely things and about found family. You know, so I I I felt that if the crew, if we were feeling like we were making this thing as a unit you know a very huge investment from a wonderful crew and all the creatives and all you know we were a very big family and we had challenges Aoife you know will tell you that we had a short shoot we had upwards of 13 vehicles we were up over these incredible mountains with monsoons and punctures and on a ferry and you know like it, there were some challenges but there was an incredible uh healing hopeful spirit about the team and about what we were trying to make and I think I think we said it at the at the read through um which is the first time we all got together you know that if we, if we felt we were really working together to make something beautiful that it would it would reflect it would come out of the screen and, and, and I think I, I hope it does I, I think it certainly does uh Lock and obviously you're a much more experienced actor uh, than Charlie and you've been You've done great work for a good while now on a lot of um, you know different things on TV and features. How has this set compared to other ones you worked on? Because it does seem to sound like there was an incredible family vibe there. Uh, the set, the set in particular. Well, or, uh, yeah, just work on the, the production in general, I guess. 
Well, well, look, it was a joy from start to finish. The days I wasn't working, I was just kind of almost slightly miserable, you know. Because, <laughs> like, because obviously, um, uh, Charlie and Olivia had a lot more uh, days on it than I did. So I would be in one day out the next, but I, I couldn't wait to get back on set. Um, but I, I suppose that the big learning curve for me was, like Emer said, working with Olivia, who doesn't do rehearsals. So you'd think somebody who's at that top flight would be uh, would be very um, would be very particular about everything that's going to happen. But she had enough confidence in herself just to allow things to happen. And uh, she'd never say this, but I, like. Uh, she almost taught me a lot more about life you know life is about what you feel you know so if when I was on set with her and I was doing a scene we'd like she just say just feel it that's all you have to do just feel it and if you kind of measure her face it's not moving that much ever at all but she's really feeling it so when someone's really feeling it in front of camera it's really happening you know and everyone can sense that and that's what she does. She trusts herself enough just to feel it. So there's no gimmicks, no games, no overplanned rehearsals or reactions. It's just whatever happens, happens. So it was great to, to, to kind of work with somebody who's got to the highest level just from having true emotions in front of camera and just to allow yourself to let go of anything you've learned in college or tricks or of the trade you've learned. And just be vulnerable and feel something. And that's that was that's something I've taken with me from that experience. I uh, see. I find that absolutely fascinating. It, it's something I could never do as an actor because I generally don't know what my face is doing at the best of times. I've been told I have resting catastrophe face where people are constantly <laughs> like, "What? What happened?" I'm like, "No, I'm fine." So it, it's really, really good. I do know exactly what you're talking about that kind of thing. I suppose when we're watching the normal, like that's great face acting where it's not like a ticky thing or like an overarching or anything. It's just you can just see it in like the little micro level almost of like of an eye kind of enlarging or something and that's that's a really beautiful kind of way of putting it just like you feel it and they'll see it yeah yeah trust your audience is way more intelligent than you give them credit for most of the time you don't need to explain stories it just and in a lot of times dialogue isn't necessary in some scenes we did one scene and there was no dialogue at all in it and i was like what is going to happen in this one where I approach her in a bedroom and Molly's asleep and I was really confused as to what was going to happen and she wasn't going to rehearse it or tell me what was going to happen and I didn't know what was going to happen or what, even what the scene meant to a certain degree you know um so we just had to just kind of go for it on the day and see what happened and uh, that was you know if I I'm not sure if I was the lead actor I'd be I'd be wanting to know a few more answers but she was like just trust yourself feel it and see what happens that's beautiful. And I think that, as you said, that's something to take into life in general, isn't it? Just, you know, trust and fail. I suppose it's supposed to be having to over prescribe things. Um, it sounds like there's a lot of trust required for that. And you were like, obviously, that's kind of the vibe you wanted on set that everyone did kind of understand and trust. And we're working towards the same uh, goal and the same heart of the film. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the, I suppose, the visuals, but also the people behind them. Like the, the locations are absolutely stunning. And Kerry is absolutely one of the most beautiful places on earth and i say that as a cork man but to be fair <laughs> <That's generous. laughs> but there, there's some great locations there i know you had carl king who's working on that as well and there was a cat was kathy strachan on costume am i right in that yes and like that, that yellow jacket against the kerry landscape uh at whatever at the time where you shot is just one of the most lovely things i think before the film was out i saw i was looking to see some shots and there was this blue the yellow and the green and I did start thinking it was like the dairy gold colors or something or carry gold colors like some kind of, <laughs> but it was absolutely stunning and so striking and just one of you talk a little bit as a director about the kind of the visual kind of idea you had did you have like a, a palette coming into it did you have an aesthetic idea or was that again part of the collaborative process yeah um you know it's a, it, it's a journey and a wonderful journey with all my uh, my core creative team kathy strachan's costume is beautiful and that came out of not, not really the Kerry colors or the Kerry gold colors because I'm a vegan, but um, it was more out of sunflowers. You know, it was about finding a way huh. for for her also to be in this landscape. And and in collaboration with James May, the wonderful DOP, Joe Fallover designer, Carl King, as you mentioned, we were so lucky to have. He just recently married a 
a Kerry woman and moved to Kerry. So a lot of conversations about having to also face what the script was. Like there was, I think three quarters of the of the script is, I think it's like 20 out of the 25 days were outdoors, you know? So how do we, how do we make something that talks to this heart, this exuberance, this vividness, this, this journey of, of it, you know, these two characters thrown together, like, oh, a classic great road movies. They don't want to be together, but they need each other. And their friendship changes as the landscape changes and trying to find incredible locations that would, would give us that palette, you know, that palette of change, that it wouldn't just feel like the same little roads we were traveling. We were over mountains. We were in glens. We were at an aqueduct. We were over a ferry. And 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 then costume and, and design and all that would that would talk to you know, that they're really in this incredible landscape and they're both part of it and outside of it, you know, and, and talking, I had, I had explored it a little bit in my previous film, uh, the, the Phil Linnett film. I was asking myself, you know, can, can the film reflect the characters, you know, can the film itself tell you something about the characters too? And this was, I think, you know, Joy's costume was trying to tell me something about Joy, you know, and somebody said to me at one stage, she doesn't look like a solicitor. And I said, well, what does a solicitor look like? You know, mm -hmm. like she she is this solicitor. She's in this moment of, of, of angry defiance, you know, taking this incredibly ludicrous in many ways decision with, with, to, with this baby that she's just mm -hmm. going to be able to move on and forget about it. And, and kind of defiantly striding across this landscape, dragging this little ruffian with her, you know, making it, making it happen. So it was all coming out of these ideas about, you know, can the film and the, and the heart of the film be be the same idea? Can they be all talking in the same language? That that's beautiful, and it's I think it's something I've learned a lot over the last years with the academy, particularly, is the role of so many things like location and costumes, particularly play like they're vital for storytelling. Have such weight in them in carrying the story and explaining character and so forth, or suggesting possibly more than explaining. Uh, yeah. There was one other thing I loved, which was the robins. Um, which I, I had thought was a universal thing, but I was explaining it to someone recently and they were like, that might just be an Irish thing. But I, I, like, I just it thought, is that, like, yeah, because uh, yeah, they, they totally get it. And they're like, oh, my God, that makes so much sense. Yeah, that's, you know, it was it was in the script that I read and, and uh, Alva and Aoife both, you know, great champions of, you know, this this mother, both having uh, lost experienced death in their lives and saying that the Robin is a representation of someone you love that follows you around and looks out for you. And, you know, it makes my heart flutter every time towards the end of the film when when Molly meets uh, the Robin in the in the in the forest and speaks with her, you know, and, and you, you know, it, so it's magic realism, but it's light, you know, it's small. And yet Molly's mother is keeping an eye on him, you know, uh, to the extent that we had amazingly complex conversations about what the Robin should do at the very end of the film. You know, should the Robin just let Molly and Joy drive off into the into the dawn or should the Robin go with them or fly away? And, you know, her work is done. I mean, you know, that's the sort of stuff that would keep you up all night. But... <laughs> and then, I like the idea that there's a... <laughs> Sorry, go on, Gar. Well, I was just going to say, I'd like the idea that there's a cut somewhere where the Robin just hops in and goes, hit it, we're going. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, Alvin, you were saying. Yeah, first of all, Robins are absolute psychopaths when you actually do the profile of the bird as a beast. So I love the fact that everyone <laughs> overlooks that because they're so like, he do have a roundy head and he's as cute as a button. They are psychopaths. But during COVID, I hand trained a Robin to, I trained a Robin to eat out of my hand and it took about five months. Um, but it was one of the greatest joys of my life because for about four months, I used to I used to sit there for about like 20 minutes every day with my hand outstretched going, how much does a robin actually weigh? Like when it lands on my hand, like can I, it was just a weird anticipation that went on and on. And then the first day it landed on my hand, I remember just being overwhelmed and I was overwhelmed at everything. It was because it was for mom and it was because it had taken so bloody long and we'd made great inroads with the film. You know, I think we just... <coughs> I think I was trying to feed, uh, hand train it when we were shooting, but, uh, but we were planning to use him as our, our, you know, not do VFX Robin, actually use this actual Robin that Alva was training, but he demanded a huge fee. It was unbelievable. So. And when I brought out the unicycle, he said, no, no, I have some respect. But um, yeah, it was a lovely kind of COVID. How project. much do they weigh? What's the answer? Exactly as you think. Very that, little. 
so <laughs> little, but like they got the tongue tongue and it was just this perfect little weight. And he'd come and he'd sit on my hand and he'd eat away and then he'd head off. And it was just a lovely morning exchange that happened oh. for a season. And then they they leave you as everyone does. You, you, as a producer, was it delightful for you to hear that your writer might also be there as Robin Wrangler and that you could show something <laughs> Absolutely. And um, it wasn't just trying to save a few quid uh, on VFX, trying to get Alva doing the Robin Wrangling. It was totally her own idea. <laughs> VFX Robin, there was a, it's funny, Gary, you say that you thought it was an international motif and yeah. then, you know, it turns out it's only Irish. I thought it was my own family motif that because we always associated Robin with my mum who passed. And then mm. I found out that Alva also did the same thing. Um, so I was blown away with that in the script. So there were points where, you know, we were struggling with the budget and we thought, oh God, will we lose the VFX Robin? Do you know, do we need it? But we always wanted to hang on to it. And I'm delighted that we did. I love the Robin in the story. I, I do too, and I know I know someone who's not Irish who, like I was explaining to, saw it and they just totally got it immediately. Yeah, like they, just, they weren't familiar, but they just totally got it. Like um, mm -hmm. just in the context, made so much sense. Um, you mentioned there, obviously, some of the VFX shots with the Robin, but um, maybe like uh, you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges you spoke of. Like obviously, amazing locations, but um, I suppose shooting anything in Ireland, uh, especially the time of year, did, did the weather cooperate? And like obviously, a lot of vehicles and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> were, there, were there any particular challenges kind of presented? And like, I suppose as a first feature, uh, narrative feature for humor, were there any kind of interesting lessons kind of that you're like, ah, okay, I'll know that the next time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, every day was like going to university, you know, like it's an incredibly steep learning curve. And I think it will be, it is and will be on every film. I, I hope it will, because, you know, it, there's so much still to learn. There's so much to learn all the time. But um, certainly shooting in Kerry, we fought very hard to make that happen, you know, films mm. often, Irish films often try to stay close to Dublin, you know, for the facilities and, you know, the, 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 the you know, the way you can shoot in the Wicklow Mountains for Kerry or whatever. So we fought really hard. Kerry was in its DNA, you know, the magic, mm. the wildness, the primal energy of Kerry was in the film's DNA. Alvis from Kerry, the film is written there. So Aoife and in collaboration with the, Screen Kerry, you know, Siobhan out down there, they worked really hard to make it make sense, you know, and, and it, you know, possibly didn't make 100% financial sense, but it made real emotional, aesthetic, joyful sense, you know, and made everybody, hard was sense, on, I guess, as well. everybody was on board with yeah. that. And that was an incredible challenge because there's so many locations in the film, there's so many vehicles, and I was bringing this huge desire to, as I say, to, to have a real proper journey, you know, like it, that it wouldn't just feel like we were just driving around near Tralee, you know, that it would feel, tap into the epic quality of the, the changes that happen in, in Joy and Molly's hearts. So, uh, you know, next time maybe I will just drive around in a circle. <laughs> 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 um, but I think you're right, like, is it, like again, that's like one of the things that like, you feel that you make that real and it comes across to me as real then, like, because I hadn't even really considered, I suppose it drives me mad when I see things set in Dublin or Galway or Cork or cities, I know, and it's like, that street's not off there. But I know a lot of the locations carry as well, it just felt all, you know, completely like a real journey on screen and, as well. And trying to avoid... You know, like, Kerry is also, as Aoife said, we weren't in the middle of tourist season because of... Mm -hmm. um, because of COVID, although it was open again. So at one point where where he where they hit the fox and, and Molly gets out and they have a little row and he throws up, that was at this, that was on the ring of Kerry, you know. So <laughs> Carl King, you know, I said to him, Yeah, we want to set it there. And he nearly lost his mind. You want me to close the ring of Kerry? You know, so <laughs> you know, it was incredible challenges, but we set that later in the evening so that we wouldn't have to close it off you know, middle, I mean, we said it in the film early morning, so we wouldn't have to close off the Ring of Kerry at two o'clock in the afternoon. You know, we close it off at like seven o'clock at night. So, you know, you work, you work around it and you get so much, you get so much energy from this feeling of, a, you know, I mean, my American road movies have kind of colonized our imagination, but one of the great things they have, like Paris, Texas, or something is this scale, you know, that the, the yeah. landscape is changing. And it was really, really important to me. And it was really important that these these characters, these exuberant, vivid characters and the cars they were in, you know, had this this great playful landscape to play in. So uh, yeah, was there challenges with weather and everything and costs and all that? Absolutely. We had Kerry, I didn't realize it until I went there in in prep <laughs> and I said to Alva. Honestly, is it like this all the time? The weather changes every half an hour, you know, and, and 
so it proved. <laughs> but we didn't, we just embraced it. You know, we didn't we didn't try to write in ADR going, oh, you know, it's raining now, yeah. the weather's terrible, or you know, we just we just went for it because if you do it with I think enough, you know, conviction, confidence. You know? Yeah. Just do it. yeah. Um, I speak of challenges, one of the things we we're talking about this briefly before we started, Charlie, uh, was I was imagining uh, working with the, the baby or babies, I believe it was, was the twin babies you used for the, yeah, yeah. Uh, is Charlie, you seem so incredibly, your performance as I mentioned is incredibly natural, but you seem so natural with the kids, that I was wondering if like you like had a lot of younger siblings or nephews or nieces or what the process was for you to be that, so it's comfortable. Yeah, no, I, I never had had a like a baby niece or anything I've never had much babies around you know when I was younger or even the age I am now but Shalom like I said the mother of the twins she let me come in she let me get really comfortable with them and you know I, I wanted to do that you know because I wanted to make it look like I was comfortable with them and I had I'd known them and that's what I really did and I got to know Shalom and Sam really well from that and I was got to a point where it'd be normal for me to just walk in as soon as I was done the scene, walk into the trailer. Oh, how are you, Shalom? You know, and then she's like, do you want to hold one of them? Yeah. And, you know, it just got to a point where it was really normal. And I really liked that because it made it so comfortable for me to be able to just, you know, pick up one of the babies as if I'd been doing it my whole life, which I was, I was really happy that I got that comfortable with them. That's that's fascinating. Like and it, it like it just comes across like because I had to ask because I was like that is either somebody spends so much time with this kid or is just really excellent with kids. But uh, apparently you're just a nice person and an excellent actor, which is you know good to hear. But a disappointing <laughs> answer from a you know half <laughs> point of view. Um, we're we're nearly out of time, guys. But I just wanted to uh, ask as well. Like the, the film obviously has resonated really strongly with audiences. Uh, I know there's like uh, a, it's it's one of those films I think that. We were kind of talking about like if you like are non-cynical and earnest with it there's such an absolute joyful heart to it that i think it does that thing that all great films do which is make you feel and think i guess as well but but how has the response been i suppose both in ireland and internationally as well it's been we've been as alva said we're getting an incredible feedback from you know audiences who who, who are surprised to find themselves laughing and sobbing mm -hmm. and you know all the good stuff you know feeling feeling their hearts kind of beating in their chest. And uh, we released just before Christmas and I'm getting so many messages on Twitter, you know, by people, women, Americans who just stumble on it, you know, and find it on their streaming. And, and, and people are really prepared to be moved, you know, people are prepared to be challenged and to, and to, yeah, you know, I, I, the, I you, the subtext sorry. of the film is really working, you know, that, that, the, you know, that you can, you can, you can love again and you're good enough and you know, you can start again and you can be reborn even, even when you've had tragedies in your life, you know, you can forgive yourself. You can forgive what has happened to yourself and, and learn to love again. Uh, absolutely. And I think like the audience journey and that is almost like you're saying, but can the film kind of mirror the, the themes and the character of it or the making of it? Cause it is, that journey is like, almost like we were saying, start getting out of your own way. Like I suppose joy as well as that kind of learning to, uh, come around in love with that. I think it's a film that does take you on a wonderful journey, you know, along with these characters, but I suppose with yourself as well. Um, on that note, I think we're going to have to wrap things up there, guys. We're just about out of time. Um, but congratulations to all of you. It's a, it's a wonderful film. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you're all doing next. And i um, very much looking forward to taking more emotional journeys with you all. So, so thank you very much, Charlie, Lachlan, Aoife, Alva and Emer. And uh, thanks to you and everyone for Joyride. Thanks, Thanks, Gar. Gar. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.